Hey guys, JoeFan82 here. Well, it's finally here after months of waiting. Issue number one of IDW's Revolution event has arrived. Before I get into it, let me tell you where I was coming from from a comic standpoint before I read this issue. Uh, the last G.I. Joe comics I read were published by Devil's Due in the early 2000s. I haven't read any of the new IDW comics as far as Transformers, I know some of the main characters and that's about it. The other properties involved in this event are relatively new to me as I believe they will be new to a lot of you as well. And let me say now, this review will have spoilers. If you don't want to know what's going to happen, then stop watching, go buy the issue, read it, come back, and uh, listen to my review. You have been warned. This is the original cover for the book, and I believe there was something like 19 alternate covers, which is a little too much if you ask me. This is Chapter 1, Concord Hymn, which seems to be referencing something, so I googled it and discovered that Concord Hymn was a poem written by Ralph Waldo Emerson for the 1837 dedication of the Obelisk, a monument in Concord, Massachusetts. This monument is commemorating the Battle of Concord, which happened at the start of the American Revolution. According to Lawrence Buell, or Buell from the Harvard University Press, this poem exalted a general spirit of revolution and freedom. The phrase, the shot heard around the world, comes from this poem and may be telling about the events to come in this series. We are given a roster of who is in this issue, and already I see there are some faces missing that I was expecting to see, namely Snake Eyes, whose image has been in most of the promotional materials I've seen. In addition to the G.I. Joe team, we've got Action Man, some Transformers, and Rom. At the beginning of the issue, we see Action Man, who is a British special agent and whose real name is Ian Noble. And that's a British name if I've ever heard one, Ian Noble. We see him gliding over Mount Olympus in Greece, and there's a big fissure or opening that he's spotted below. And then we see that he's got a sidekick with him called Agent Terence Sammons, who is monitoring his condition from a plane. So Action Man enters a cave and finds a bunch of glowing purple crystals and Big Ben, who is not in good shape. He's half buried under this stuff, and he's got these purple crystals coming out of him. And we see that Big Ben is a mercenary, no longer working with G.I. Joe. Big Ben tells Action Man that his team was following some covert operatives, and after a firefight, he found some of their dog tags, which were G.I. Joe issued. So. I'm already thinking those guys were some kind of imposters. G.I. Joe would never attack Big Ben. Then the whole place starts shaking and these crystals start giving off more and more energy. Action Man barely escapes before the whole place explodes, killing Big Ben. So I guess we won't be seeing him again anytime soon. Which is sad. I really liked Big Ben. Meanwhile, back in Washington, D.C., we see the President of the United States talking to General Joe Colton, and it looks like the Transformers, or Cybertronians, as they're called, are being blamed for the explosion on Mount Olympus. And those glowing purple crystals are connected to Or 13 which is food for the Transformers, also known as Energon. And apparently this stuff is all over the world, and it's all becoming unstable, and they're freaking out that the whole world is going to explode or something like that. And I guess this happened in a Transformers book prior to this, but uh, Optimus Prime basically told the world that we are now joining the Cosmic Community, which sounds a lot like the United Federation of Planets from Star Trek. And nobody trusts the Transformers because the Decepticons killed a bunch of people at some time before now. This part was a little confusing for me. I have to mention here that this woman does not look old enough to be president. I'm just saying. Then we see Scarlet and learn that she is now the field commander for G.I. Joe, which is a big change 
from what I've seen in other G.I. Joe comics, and she's basically all for going out and fighting the Transformers. We cut to Autobot City, which is a Cybertronian embassy on Earth. Optimus Prime is saying, great, everyone's going to blame us for this now. Let's go try to explain that it wasn't us. And Soundwave is there, and he's a good guy. He's still got the Decepticon logo on him there, so that's a little weird. If I was Optimus, I'd say, hey, can you maybe take that off? You know? Then we move to Portland, Oregon, to a mobile G.I. Joe command center. And the Joes know that they were impersonated in Greece, and they're still pissed at the Transformers, and they're basically looking for a fight. They find Jazz and Arky helping some humans during a flood, and that would make me stop and say, this doesn't make any sense. Why would they be trying to blow up the planet and helping humans at the same time? And Scarlet starts to think the same thing, and Colton, who looks more like Hawk or Duke, by the way, says they are not our friends. And this just seems a little odd to me, and maybe it's his expression, but it just seems weird. So instead of trying to talk to them, Scarlet has mainframe shoot at Jazz for no reason, which is really not cool. So far, G.I. Joe's not looking too good in this issue. And of course, the Transformers are like, why are you doing this? What's wrong with you? I want to stop and mention that I really like this art. I was worried what it was going to look like, but I really like it. I think it's very well done. So more Joes show up, and a battle breaks out. They're fighting, they're fighting. Then Optimus comes in, and everything stops for a second. And he tries to talk some sense into the Joes, who just look like jerks now. I'm on the Transformer side at this point, and no one listens to Optimus. They keep on attacking. Roadblock and Rock and Roll come in. Mainframe joins the scene with Mayday, who is listed as a warrant officer. Is she Flint's replacement? We have not seen him at all. Mainframe's got a beef with Soundwave for killing his friends years ago. Mayday's like, he's a good guy now, and Mainframe's like, I don't care. I love this line. He says, the mission is to bring one back alive, but it won't be that one. And before he can get a shot off, Soundwave uh, makes a, or releases an EMP, and it knocks all the power out, and we see Soundwave telling the Joes, consider yourselves lucky. <sighs> is it just me? I can't see Soundwave as a good guy. He's got to be a double agent or something. And also in this issue, uh, the way that he speaks doesn't sound like the sound wave that I'm familiar with from the original cartoon, which he, when he sounded very computer-like. Uh, in this issue, he just seems to be talking in a normal, more, more normal speaking voice, which is different. So the EMP knocks out Slipstream's ship and Victorian catches it and brings it safely back to Earth. If I was Scarlet, I would be like, okay, maybe we should hear what they have to say at this point. And once more, Optimus asks for some cooperation from the Joes, and then Beachhead decides to shoot Optimus in the face. That's right, he shoots him in the face. I didn't see that coming. So Optimus gets shot in the face and he looks pissed, like the Terminator. Then we see Beachhead looking like he's going to pee his pants. I've never seen that expression of Beachhead before, but if you've got a giant robot looking at you like that, you might be a little scared too. Some fighting continues. Then we see Agent Helix coming in. Then they see someone new coming. It's not a Transformer, it's Rom. And as soon as he shows up, Colton tells the Joes to ignore the Transformers and kill Rom. So he must know who Rom is, even though nobody else there does, which is a little fishy. And in a split second, Rom just destroys Colton, or who everyone thinks is Colton. When I read this the first time, I was like, oh, crap. But after the second reading, I'm convinced it's not really him. So 
So Rom kills a few more supposed Joes, and Scarlet tells everyone to attack Rom. Roadblock unloads on Rom, and Rom just stands there and takes it, again, like the Terminator, and he doesn't fire back. So you start thinking, why is he only killing certain people and not just everyone? Jazz starts to confront Rom, but Rock and Roll starts shooting at Jazz, and Rom just flies away. That's it. The Transformers chase after him, leaving Scarlet to think Rom and the Transformers are still the bad guys. And she basically says, they killed Joe Colton, they just declared war, and it's to be continued. So here are my thoughts. Let's start with the good. It's got lots of action, not too much, not too much dialogue. The art is great. It's very clean, and you can tell who everyone is. The bad, there were some things in here that I felt I would have understood better if I had been reading the IDW continuity of both G.I. Joe and Transformers prior to this. So I was a little disappointed with that. I was hoping I would be able to jump into this issue without any prior knowledge and get what was going on. Uh, I'm, I wasn't totally lost, but there were references made to past events, and I didn't know what they were talking about. Also, I was expecting to see a few more Joes, especially uh, the top tier ones like Duke, Hawk, Flint, and especially Snake Eyes. With Snake Eyes being in most of the promo art for this event, I have a feeling we'll be seeing him at some point. And after reading this, I'm left wondering, how did Scarlet become field commander of G.I. Joe? How did that happen? If you know the answer to any of these questions, please let me know in the comments. I'm sure I'm not the only one asking them. And my final thoughts on this issue, this was a solid first issue. I'm interested to see what happens next and to find out who the villain is for this series. There was no mention of Cobra in this issue, and I feel like Cobra might not even appear at all. I could be wrong, but we'll have to wait and see. At the end of the issue, IDW decided to reprint their prelude story from Free Comic Book Day, which takes place before the issue we just read. So in this little issue, we have Scarlet and Joel Colton having a conversation. We found out that Action Man and Joel Colton were both members of the Adventure Team, which is a reference to the 12-inch G.I. Joe action figure line from the 70s, and the Adventure Team was disbanded, and they gave Colton a desk job. And that's when G.I. Joe was formed. We see Hawk and Duke, so they do exist in this continuity. Then we see this mysterious guy in the shadows who brings up the reason they're there to talk about the Transformers. Colton says they came to Earth to find the purple crystals called Ore 13, which can be refined into Energon, which the Transformers use for food. They know about the Autobots and Decepticons. Colton says Optimus lied to them about being an ally and basically let Megatron kill a billion people. But he came back and supposedly helped them rebuild, and then they all left again. Uh, then after the Transformers left, Cobra showed up and they started causing problems. And we get a nice shot of Snake Eyes and Helix fighting a bunch of red ninjas. And apparently a big fight happened and a bunch of people died and G.I. Joe was disbanded because of it. And their replacement was called the Earth Defense Command or EDC. And this mysterious guy was a part of it when the Transformers came back. Scarlet lets us know that Optimus came back, but they don't trust him. He raised a giant Transformer called a Titan, and the Transformers think this is a really significant event for some reason that's not clear to me. They make a reference to this new action man and say he could be of use to them. Scarlet refers to the mysterious man as Director Mannheim, and we see them looking at a video of Rom supposedly randomly killing people, and Colton says... I seriously doubt any of this is random, which is a very interesting thing for him to say. And they bring up Or 13 and how it's becoming unstable all over the world. Scarlet says that because of this, the Earth will be engulfed in a nuclear inferno in a matter of weeks, which doesn't sound good. And she blames Optimus and the Autobots for it. So this 
sort of puts Scarlett's viewpoint from the first issue into perspective. A whole bunch of people died because of the Transformers, so now uh, G.I. Joe and everybody else, they just don't trust any of them. Then Colton turns to director Mannheim, or Miles, and asks if he'll be able to help them disrupt Optimus' plans, and Mannheim says, Disruption is my specialty, Joe. You gave me my nickname in the adventure team. You remember why you called me Miles Mayhem. Boom. So we find out that mysterious man in the shadows is actually Miles Mayhem, who was the main villain in the Mask series. At the same time, we find out he was on the adventure team with Colton, which is a really nice way to tie them together. This is the end of the issue, and we see Miles sitting beneath what looks like a Transformer that's been dismantled and is being held prisoner. I do not recognize this Transformer, and I feel like I should. If you know who this is, let me know in the comments. It seems like it's a pretty important character. And this was just a really nicely drawn shot. Great art in this issue as well. I feel like they should have included this before issue number one instead of placing it at the end. It really brings some things into perspective, especially Scarlet's motivation for how she's acting in issue number one. So that's my review of IDW's Revolution number one. What did you guys think of this book? Let me know in the comments below. You can find me on social media via the links in the description for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.